Hello and welcome to episode 60 of the Aquarius Podcast. I'm your host, Randy Reed. This episode is sponsored by Owaza Living Water, and in particular, the Biomaster line of canister filter. And the great thing about this canister filter is the built-in heater integration, but on top of that, the pre-filter contraption. And what I mean by pre-filter contraption, they've got this doohickey on the priming pump where you basically lock up your system on the intake outtake side, unlock it on the priming side, pull this entire assembly out, your whole pre-filter assembly, and you've got sponges there. What's the beauty of that? Those are your pre-filters. So those are stopping all the major crud getting into your canister filter, which means that you have much easier and quicker initial maintenance. So the one thing we all dread about the canister filter is when we have to crack that sucker open and clean out the entire contents of it, whether you're using tank water, whether you're using tap water, whatever it may be, we all dread it. Some of you out there, you may be a glutton for punishment, you may like it, but me, not necessarily. So with this feature, the pre-filter cleaning makes it so much better. I love it on this canister filter. Get the Biomaster 250, the 350, or the 600. Check it out. Owaza Living Water. So before we kick this interview off, I want to say a big thank you again to Greg Steves. And I've actually linked one of his videos that he has up on YouTube that talks about the Keras program and how important it is. So please check that out. I hope you enjoy it. Um, get involved with Keras program and enjoy hearing Greg Steves for the second time on the Aquarius podcast. Now, on to the interview. So hello and welcome to the Aquarius podcast. It is Monday, June 10th. 12.51 in the p.m. in the beautiful Pacific Northwest. I am sitting on a fallen over, potentially nurse log. I don't know if it's quite a nurse log, but it's a log and there's moss on it. And I'm sitting here with none other than episode eight alumni, Greg Steves. How you doing, sir? <laughs> <laughs> no, this is not getting edited. This is, <laughs> oh, this is as is. <laughs> you have to stay, yes. <laughs> doing good, Randy. Hey, this is a, man, of all the places, I thought I would be doing a podcast at. This is not one of them. Yeah, so to set the scene, um, you know, I, I always say, or I say Pacific Northwest when, when I'm recording from my home studio or greater Seattle area. So we are um, outside of Gold Bar, Washington, which is about an hour northeast of Seattle. And we are um, at Wallace Falls State Park on the Wallace Falls Trail. And Greg and I, we've just hiked for... I don't know, it seemed like a half a day, a couple days, I think we... I've seen the sign that said 63,000 feet high. Is so it, yeah, there you go. That plane is actually looking for us. We've been gone for so yeah, long. Looking down at it. I know. This oh, is, we're down here. We're up here. Yeah, this is a, this is a moderately a moderately easy hike uh, by, you know, by most standards, I would say. A beautiful, beautiful hike. A couple... Um, Wallace Falls has a couple waterfall sections, and we've got a mm, chance to snap nice. some good pictures. And yeah, so so Greg, you are out here uh, because you are speaking at Greater Seattle Aquarium Society tonight. And Very tomorrow. honored. Yes. Yeah. Yep. And and kudos to myself. You are now the second alumni of the Aquarius Podcast that has now come to speak at the Seattle Sweet. Aquarium Society. Uh, number two, huh? Well, well, number two. I mean. You could be number three, right? <laughs> yeah, I mean, right. Hey, you're a solid number two, though. Right? Oh, yeah. You're, not a, <laughs> you're a well-formed. Yeah, I made the top five. You're I'm a right. well-formed number two. Uh, it's great to be here, man. This is an incredible spot. I wish we could do video from here because uh, let me set the stage for you. We're Like Randy said, we're sitting on a fallen log, beautiful worn path. There's tall what are these douglas firs uh mix of a lot of cedars japanese I see, you you, japanese, you need to get off <laughs> so, some firs and cedars <laughs> yeah and they're they're like telephone poles they're free there's tall yeah they're straight up you don't have trees like this in austin in hill country no <laughs> no, no. <laughs> these are these are sky blocking yeah uh yeah, there, there's a lot of trees here. Look at this one yeah. here with all the branches coming out, just short little branches, all moss covered. Yeah, it's that crazy. Is some cool stuff right there. Yeah, and I really hope we actually moved a little bit away from the trail uh, because, you know, the closer, well, in certain sections, you're right next to the waterfall, so the ambient noise is, is a little bit too loud for a podcast, but hopefully there's just enough where if, if we go quiet like this, people might be able to hear the waterfall. That could be the sweat Hopefully. dripping off me too. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> it's one or the other. <laughs> that's just a that's just a nice healthy glow. Is all that is. Yeah. <laughs> nice visual there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so so Greg, from a to, to bring it back to tropical fish, what have uh, what have you been up to since you and I talked 
about a wow. year ago, I would say. That we talked about ago, Cares yeah. and Lake Victoria. Um, we did. Cares trucks is trucking on. Um, we've had a lot more involvement and and You're uh, welcome. <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> of course it's basically all because of the Aquarius podcast. <laughs> you said no one ever. <laughs> uh, but uh, you know, it's it's the regular thing that with a lot of growth. You have to play and catch up if you're not if you're not ready for it, and unfortunately, you know that's we're in there now. It's just we want things to move a lot quicker and and, get, and uh, application to get processed a lot quicker than they are, and uh, we're working through it, but we'll get through it. It'll and be uh, fine. Is it is it growth because of growing membership, growing interest in the program, or or growth because oh man, there's way more fish that we're starting to put on the oh man, that guy scared the crap out of me. This guy just went by on the trip. <laughs> It's like, whoa, he startled me. I'm like, what was that? Um, Hi, guys. Hello. Yeah, we've got people going by on the trail, so good times. It's a, it's a Monday, so it's not too popular or it's not too busy, but there's signs of life. We're not, right. we're not too far out there. If one um, of us takes a heart attack yeah, exactly. and gets abandoned yeah. by the other guy, maybe someone will find us eventually. I so. thought I was going to have to eat you. <laughs> I, was already, I was already sizing you up. <laughs> Which arm to start the, with? The left, the left uh, lower part. Drumstick. <laughs> But uh, yeah, the whole CARES thing, um, we've had a lot of international growth too, which has been really cool. It's something we always thought might happen, and it, and it has. Um, what country do you see a lot of growth Mostly from? the UK. Oh, UK? Yep. Okay. Mm-hmm. So far. But we've just had a, a club come on board from China too. Nice. Which is really neat, yeah. So That's awesome. It's, it's truly become a, a global organization, and, and while we... While we work the specifics out of it, it's nice to know that the CARES attitude and uh, our end goals are shared by people all over the world. So That's great. Yeah. But are, are you staying also busy on the, we need to keep adding more fish to the, the CARES well, um, library, if you will, of, of fish that are you know, endangered and needing un- involvement? Un- unfortunately... That's somewhat true. Yeah. Uh, instead of, however, instead of adding to areas, there, there's some, we call them areas of concern mm-hmm. that we're trying to, uh, uh, trying to get cataloged. Are like, way back down now? <laughs> yes, we are. <laughs> you still have uh, about a quarter of a mile, I guess. Are you getting it? Yeah. Okay. yeah. Barely. <laughs> <laughs> what I would call difficult. Right? No, it's, it, it's good. Leisurely. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, and yeah. the trail is switchback enough. Yeah. And it's cooler, but it's drier up here. Mm-hmm. It is. You're staying in a podcast interview, by the way. I'm, you're I'm, on. Gonna keep, I'm you're keeping live. you in this podcast <laughs> interview. <laughs> <laughs> no, you're staying, sir. Take care, sir. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, uh, oh, yes, the area of areas of concern. There's a lot of... People are going to think we're in, like, a city park or something. <laughs> Probably. Like, these guys, these guys didn't go on some <laughs> strenuous hike. They're just out of shape. <laughs> Good times. Hi guys. Hey. Hello. Well, then you keep saying hi to everybody, and that's you. Yeah. <laughs> I invite it, right? He's Canadian. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody's perfect, right? <laughs> um, so that we know there's there's parts of the world that aren't that are are care specific, but we haven't uh, cataloged them well, especially South America. Um, we started on the catfish down there, but there's a lot of cichlids and uh, kerosens, all kinds of fish. So uh, we're working away at it, but we've already done a lot. Um, it, it's, a, it's a sad state of affairs when you have to add more mm-hmm. fish to the list. Are there any really exciting like reintroduction stories in the, in the past year? Uh, let's see. Since we've spoken, we had uh, Ciprinodon alvarezi. Um, there's some work going on in Madagascar with Dr. Loisel introducing some cichlid species down there. Uh, other, I can't think of much more other than that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there might be. I hope there is, but none that I'm uh, involved with anyway on a personal level. Yeah. It, it, as far as Madagascar goes, from your lens of what you see, is it? You know, we we need to do what we can, but it seems like it's it's on a path that is <coughs> irreversible, unfortunately. Yeah. yeah. I wish I could be more optimistic right. about things, but Madagascar is not unique. It's, uh, yeah, it's a, it's a land that needs a lot of attention, but I think the, the area that has, as a cichlid keeper, that has me worried the most 
at this time, even more so than Lake Victoria, is Lake Malawi. Um, I don't know if you, when you talked to Pam, did you have a chance to go over some of the we, I some of the things that were going on there? I think she. Went, I don't think we talked much about Lake Malawi. I think she referred me to Larry. Um, oh, okay, Larry to, Johnson. Yeah, yeah, to talk about Malawi. Um, we focused a little bit more. What do we focus on? Tanganyika, I believe, right? With with Pam. Oh, gotcha. Okay. Um, but yeah, I mean, Malawi borders the Congo, correct? Yeah. Well, the big problem. Well, there's many problems in Malawi, but as I understand, they've uh, using small mesh size. A lot of the uh, native fishermen and trawlers and things are taking the utaka, the the plankton eating fish. Oh. Out of Malawi, so the the without a without anything to really take care of the the, the plankton in the lake, the water's gotten murky and cloudy, and uh, it's just become a a really really big mess. A lot of we don't know the extent of what's going on there in mm-hmm. terms of species uh, extinction. And so to understand that a little bit more, so if. Uh, the plankton cloud, the water, not enough water, light is penetrating to the rock, and so algae mm-hmm. formation? There's or? just a whole host of just problems really, that okay. come with it. There's, there's algae formation, and we have areas that uh, when you don't have a lot of water flow or, or you know, uh, where the oxygen can get mixed with the water, um, it, it tends to be the water becomes stagnant, and you have uh, an increase in snail-ridden disease like blazaria and things like that. Uh, but it's the the extinction of species, primarily due to overfishing. That's the big problem mm-hmm. now, as I understand it. Mm-hmm. So that's a big concern. A lot of the a lot of the fish that people have in their tanks that might not be in the on the cares list at this time, there's a good chance that they will be in the near future. Especially the haplochromine types that we think of when we talk about Utaka or Alanacara, Protomelis, Capatochromus, things like that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's a sad state of affairs. And I don't see any way of rectifying it at this point. Yeah, because there, there's so many humanitarian, governmental infrastructure things that need to happen before we can even begin to, <coughs> you know, see light at the end of the tunnel for these little fish, right, in the, yeah. in the larger ecosystem in the lake. And really, in the grand scheme of things, these little fish are, are not the primary uh, day-to-day interest of many sure. people there. Yeah. So yeah, survival. Survival I mean, is more of a... Yeah. And they've opened the lake up to oil exploration and, really? and all kinds of things like that. Yeah. Are they, some of the, are they finding any? Yeah. Oh, wow. But some of the national parks, or, or the big national park they have, like, I think it's called Malawi National Park, was uh, meant to be a world... Well, it is a world heritage site. Um, but there's not, a, there, there's not the resources to properly patrol it and fish are being poached from there and it, it's just a mess yeah as i understand it yeah so i um, keep that on your radar if you're a malawi cichlid hobbyist the it's it's just so unfortunate there's just no you know overwhelming positive news to report uh, out of those areas it, it, it really it gets like depressing it's, sometimes yeah it's just sad it really conversation is. after after sad conversation around these reports i spoke um, in uh i spoke at a conference not too long ago and i did a, a uh, I did a special presentation for them on cares and uh, fish that needed attention and so forth. And, you know, by the end of it, I thought there were going to be fish keepers jumping off bridges and things like that because it was so depressing. I was <laughs> I was sad myself. So, mm-hmm. yeah. So then when you see people breeding the, uh, the peacock hybrids or the various African cichlid hybrids, does it almost make you kind of like, ah, oh, I wish you were just... I get sick to my stomach. Just kind of keeping it straight. To the- I, I don't like hybrids. I don't like... Uh, well, the, here's my thing with hybrids. First of all, I like natural fish, but that's a personal decision. Mm-hmm. But in a... In a deeper part of me I see a person with a tank full of uh, Alanacara hybrids or OBs whatever they Mm -hmm. call them and I'm thinking to myself man you could have that tank could be so utilized for a fish that really needs help Mm -hmm. you know what I mean and that's how I feel about it and uh, I know not everyone agrees with me but I call those people wrong (laughs) (laughs) and and that's you know there's room in this hobby for that um, and there's room in this hobby for you to plead your case, to make your case. Like when you go around the, the country um, at clubs like GSA, it's like you, you now have a platform, kind of a free speech platform, if you will, to present, mm-hmm. you know, on tonight you're going to talk about uh, collecting native fish in your, in your mm-hmm. Texas area. Uh, but Tuesday night, you're, you know, the main lineup, I think you're going to talk about 
cares and, and yeah, hypochromines. Mm -hmm. So you know you have that opportunity, and people can um, can listen to that, and you know maybe you'll sway some opinions, maybe you won't. But that'd be nice if yeah. even if one person thinks about it, mm -hmm. it's worth it. Yeah, you know what I mean. Yeah, and then you get to hang out with me and do hikes. Well, so. then there's that. <laughs> <laughs> You're like, do I have to? Does he? Does he have to be the no, one? No, that's takes been me out? fantastic. I've loved this. This has been a great day. Yeah, and Wonderful. as well, one of the things I didn't think of is as we stop, mosquitoes. We're, so, folks, we're having to fend off mosquitoes as we sit here in this beautiful little. Uh, you know what area. I haven't seen today? We've walked. Uh, Birds. We walked that too. About two and a half miles. A lot of it up quite an incline. There hasn't been one piece of trash. That has been wonderful. Not a cigarette butt, not, not a, a, a bottle cap, nothing. Yeah, I think there's... So awesome. Yeah, the leave no trace. I think leave no trace principle is pretty good here. Yeah. I, I did see one dog poop bag that I'm assuming oh, it's like, you? hey, the owner's going to come back and get it. Although, I don't think we saw any dogs as we finished the leg. <laughs> so that was a leave your... Hey, yeah. so shame on you. Whoever you were That's right. on June if 10th, we, we leave find your poop you. bag. Not good on you. <laughs> so uh, let's bring it to uh, your personal fish room. So how are things in your fish room? Um, I don't know. If I scrape the algae off the tanks and have a look, <laughs> maybe I can give you a better answer. Yeah, you're just going for the, the, the true natural the, look. The, oh, natural, yeah. Um, the, the fish are doing well. Uh, I've had a somewhat of an epiphany, epiphany, epiphany uh, about my fish keeping. Uh, as much as I hate to do it in order to keep... I've got to downsize somewhat in order to maintain um, as many of the fish that I can in in as good a quality accommodations as I can. And what what is so, that? Paint the picture for folks. So, like right okay. now, how many tanks? How many species do you have? And what do you see in a best case scenario? You downsizing to tanks and species wise? Um, well, I think the thing that bothers me most is I'm not harvesting a lot of the young that I have from these care species. And it's not because I don't want to, it's just because life has taken a turn and I've become active in other things. It doesn't mean I've lost my zest for the fish. I just don't have the time anymore to devote to the entire fish hut that I have. So I would like to downsize probably in half. So I, I guess I'm running in the age somewhere... 60 or 70 tanks right now i'd like to bring that down to 20 well-maintained tanks mm -hmm. i think that would be really good mm -hmm. uh, of, of species that need help what are these give me five of those species where you're like i know for for a fact okay these five are going to stay a in platitaniatus degani what's that that's a uh lake victoria snail eating cichlid yeah they're they've uh, been extinct in the wild hi folks uh since i think they were collected in 1982 and they haven't been seen since. Oh, wow. Yeah. Um, that's one species I would like to keep going. Uh, is this the Chromus phytophagus? That has a sentimental value to me because uh, Dr. Loisel brought that back from Lake Canyabolai in, in the uh, mid-90s. And phytophagus, so it's phytoplankton? It's eating something in the name? Um, you know, there was a time when I would have known that. Phytophagus. I'll get back to you. Okay. <laughs> but the phagus is eating, though. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So it's eating something. It's, uh, yeah. I used to know all those names and what they meant and everything. I, I, you'll have to excuse me. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, uh, no worries. <laughs> I will blame it on uh, oxygen deprivation. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> uh, the phytophagus, for sure. Uh, most of the fish are, they're all cares fish, but they would have sentimental value to me. Mm -hmm. uh, Lawrence has brought me a couple species, like uh, uh, one he has, Haplochromus casuli. That's a really cool fish. Um, and he brought that back, and uh, I've worked with it, and that's one I would keep going. Um, I don't remember all I, ha I have there. Uh, I've got a, a really neat... Uh, um, where is that? Uh, Lake Kivu species. Mm -hmm. um, not 100% sure of what species it is, but uh, the New England Club brought it in some time ago, and I was honored to be able to work with it. I think that's another one that Lawrence planted to me, too. So there's a number of them that, mm -hmm. that I, I will never part with. I'll always work with. Yeah. But there's some that, even though they're cares fish, they're uh, uh, 
potentially there's, abundant enough out there with other not, keepers? Not, not so much in the wild, but there's enough people and they're being farmed, right. enough quarries working with them, that I feel confident that I don't need to. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like the right. white cloud minnow, you're not going to lose sleep over that. <laughs> what I'm thinking of is Chindongo demasoni, or Chindongo salicai is another one, um, uh, Serticara mori, these cichlids from Malawi that are very popular. And mm -hmm. although they're not doing well in the wild, uh, there's enough of them in captivity that I'm, mm -hmm. I'm sure they'll they'll be around for a while and mm -hmm. in good good condition. Yeah, mm -hmm. and so some of these other interests as well that you know you're you're kind of diversifying with, with what free time you have. Um, <coughs> if diversifying is the right word, so some of it is kind of the autobahn activities, right? The uh, the bird watching and whatnot. Which I made is, a I made a, a kind of a commitment at the at the in the new year to as I'm getting older, uh, it's tougher and tougher to keep active and keep in shape and it's something that you have to really work at mm -hmm. so in the new year I decided I was going to make a very conscious effort to uh, uh, try and get in better shape and get more active and and I have I mean I've, I'm very proud of the progress I've made so far I've got a long ways to go to where I want to be but um, I feel more vigorous and and I look forward to all these hikes and walks and things that I probably couldn't do last year at this time I'm, I'm having a real lot, uh, a lot of fun with so yeah. um, I think that will probably even you know might even prolong the amount of time you're you're in decent enough shape to do this yeah. because so I want to I want to sail things out as long as I can and yeah. and that's been a big part of my life this year so. well, we talked about it at, at breakfast but um, fish collecting or you know having being a tropical fish keeper, being an aquarist, mm -hmm. there is a finite number of fish, there's a finite number of tanks that you will be able to have in your possession. For some mm -hmm. people, it's in the hundreds. Yep. For some people, it's one. Right. But this hobby is wonderful, but then there's also very much a limiting factor where, um, you know, the collectoritis, you know, it, unless you're going to turn and burn species out of your tanks, yep. um, unless you're going to overcrowd, there will be a point where you've reached this kind of I probably shouldn't get any more tanks. I probably shouldn't get any more species. It takes species. a lot of discipline to do that. It does. And then you may be, like, whatever that number is for you, you may be able to, um, you know, manage that number. But yes. then you still have another, you, you still need more outlets for, for to be creative, to explore, yep. um, to consume your free time that hopefully isn't just, you know, binge watching TV, which, hey, if you want to do that, I guess, cool. But for you, bird watching, is something that kind of fills that, right? Yeah, I've, uh, I've taken it up the last couple of years, and uh, it's something I never, ever thought in a million years I would see myself doing. I'm with you, man. I'm slowly, like, yeah, yeah I'm, I'm slowly. <laughs> Watch, like, man, it. Birds Watch kinda, it. No, birds are kind of cool. Like, They're very the... cool, especially when you, <clears throat> it gets really bad because I've got such a compulsive personality that I've got to find them all. You know what yeah, I mean? Yeah. Every I want something new every day. I want to find another one and add to my list and stuff. And it, it's that uh, that quest that keeps me going. But uh, and this is great because you don't have to worry about you know captive raising these birds. Like it's just, yeah, it's I, just I don't view, want anything just, to do with captivity. I want them out in the wild. Yeah, it's just and where viewing them yep. and checking it on a box and moving on. Exactly. Where it's a little bit more difficult, like you don't get the same satisfaction as an aquarist going to somebody's house and being like, "Oh man, right, you've got right, that right. awesome geofig that I've been, you know." But I've been it eyeing. is in a way because if we're out today and I happen to see a, some kind of nuthatch or something that mm -hmm. I've never seen before, I would get excited, just as excited about that as I would spawning one of my rare species of fish that I have at home. But it's I yours. know it sounds crazy. No, 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 but it's yours in your fish room. <laughs> what I'm saying is in somebody else's fish room. Right, right. That's a different story. Yes. You, yeah, you doing right, the spawning, right. yep. where, where this where bird watching is satisfaction on a different level. It's satisfaction on a transient, um, single experience, not having to capture it, not having to, to yeah. go out in the wild and collect it physically and transport it back home and raise it. It's just... The Watching perfect analogy for me is like that stupid Pokemon Go thing where people are going around, you know, 
And I, I, I laugh, I think, I can't believe people are doing that. And then I think about myself, I'm kind of doing the same thing only with real things. Uh-huh. You know what I mean? Yeah. But anyways, it's been fun. I've really enjoyed it. And yeah. Like I said, it's not something I thought I would ever do, but I'm having a yeah. ball with it. And I, and I bet there's people that do are very serious in the bird watching that on one hand, they're internally conflicted because they want more people to appreciate bird watching. But on the other hand, they don't want masses of the public right? yeah, out yeah, yeah. in these beautiful, pristine You don't want to give up your secret spots. Right. <laughs> yeah. Oh, no, no. That red-breasted sucker. I'm the only one that knows where that guy is. I'm not. No, you're not catching him. I'll Put give you a picture. List. That's all I'm giving you. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, man. But that's another part of it. Photography is another carryover from the fish thing. Mm-hmm. Um, you're writing a lot of fish articles and, and different books and doing a lot of photography with it was something that I found just as rewarding. And a big part of my hobby is keeping fish. And now translate that into the whole birding thing. I, I like taking, mm-hmm. you know... Uh, bird photography too and, and that's kind of a have you met a, have you met the Greg Steves of the bird hobby not yet because the Lawrence but, the Lawrence Ken of the bird hobby is the Lawrence Ken of the fish hobby that's but true <laughs> who's, the, who's the Greg Steves of the bird hobby I don't know I think I probably might meet one of them tomorrow You're like who's this dork it's yeah. oh, that's, a, that's a bird person that, what's wrong with them <laughs> there's a couple it's funny there's a, a friend of mine and we talk quite a bit there's a uh, a website called, or a Facebook site called Birds of Texas, and there's some beautiful photography on there. These people are great, and every now and then I'll see this one guy. He he's just a uh, an incredible photographer, and he posts these pictures of species that I'm looking for, and I haven't gotten. Every time I see him, like a a little part of me inside gets really irate. You know, <laughs> I get all mad. Are there are there cheaters in the bird watching hobby? Yes, I bet there are. Right? There has to be. There has to be. No, no, I told. I totally. That's yeah. I saw that guy. <laughs> uh, I didn't get my camera out in time, but no, I totally saw that bird. Well, I'm involved with something called uh, eBird. Okay, it's through Cornell University, and a lot of bird birders use it, and it's a, it, it tracks your the number of species you've seen on a walk. Like I, I'll do one today or tomorrow, uh, um, and it tracks where you are the number of birds you you've seen or witnessed and everything and you can add uh sounds to it if you if you record sounds or photos what what have you but there's a lot of times these people will put on their list you know seen a dodo yeah <laughs> <laughs> an ivory billed woodpecker uh, or didn't see it but i heard its call you know two two ridges away through you know an echo i could i it was definitely distinctly one of those and yeah sure buddy you know so anyways i Uh, there's a bit of skepticism in me unless you have a picture of it i don't you know i guess because for me i wouldn't believe myself unless mm -hmm. i seen the picture sure so sure (laughs) oh good times yeah so so to bring it back home to uh to fish again um you recently were a judge in a biotope oh, yeah. aquascaping that competition. Excellent, excellent. Yeah, in Canada, in uh, uh, Toronto, outside Toronto. So this whole biotope thing is taking the fish world over by storm. And I really like it a lot. Uh, whereas in the past you would have fish shows um, that would have you know a bear tank and a sponge filter and, and a species of fish, the biotope contest or, or biotope category is you try to set a tank up as natural as possible to show the fish off in a natural type setting in the confines of an aquarium, if that makes any mm-hmm. sense. And the, the fish is more comfortable and acts a little more naturally and it's more aesthetically pleasing. And it takes a lot more work, but uh, it's an aspect of the hobby that's really catching on uh, when it comes to showing and stuff like that. And I really like it a lot. So how many entrants were there in this competition? Uh, I want to say about 12, 12? maybe a dozen. Yeah. yeah. And then what were the, so what was the <laughs> criteria? Like if somebody was wanting to enter this thing, um, what did, what did the, the entry flyer look like for someone? Well, um, you have to, hi folks. It, it, you have to be able to, uh, if you can imagine it, take a chunk of nature and have natural plants, natural, uh, a decor and natural animals, all that might be found together in the confines of an aquarium. Mm-hmm. So it was a, it's a really neat concept and it's a great way to show the fish and was invertebrates there a, Was or there something. a standard size, like 40 breeder only, or was, what, what was? Uh, you know, I'm trying to think. I think they were in uh, 20 gallon tanks, 20 okay. longs, I, I believe. 
I'll have to go back and look at my Like, I feel like there, there would be, like, a level size playing field, right? Like, someone can't bring in a 300-gallon tank against a 10-gallon. Well, they did, it in, uh, they did it in Washington, too, and, and it was... Some of those little tanks, people are great aquascapers mm-hmm. and can make them look incredible. Oh, yeah. So I've seen, I've seen some of the smaller tanks set up to look. Those are probably some of the best setups I've seen, rather than the larger tanks mm-hmm. with a big piece of driftwood and some, uh, you know. But the one in Canada was really neat because it contained a lot of native uh, Great Lakes fish. Mm-hmm. So there were everything from mollusks like mussels and crayfish to darters. And uh, and that was the theme was to be native to Great Lakes or was no, it? No, it was just biotope. So it just happened to be that most entrance. Right, did. right. With, okay. With what they know naturally. But, I mean, you could have done a Lake Tanganyika tank with uh, multi uh, multipunctatus. We have a bunch of shells right. and shell dwellers, but really what kind of a display is that? I mean, you can have a biotope tank that looks totally natural as what you might see, but not everything that you see is aesthetically pleasing. Right. Like when you go diving and you just see a, a bunch of sand with a rock in the middle, that's not as nice as going into a, an area with lush plant growth mm-hmm. and you know, uh, moss growing on a piece of driftwood and things like that. So when you do a biotope, you not only have to keep in mind what is natural for for the species that you're trying to show, but also what is aesthetically pleasing. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. yeah. So, so how much homework did you have to do before coming into this? Like, you know, oh, that hey, that, that, that mollusk doesn't belong in this particular setup. Like, what? <laughs> um, I didn't, in all uh, all truthfulness, I didn't have the knowledge to know if this mussel is found in that area of mm-hmm. water. I basically took people's word for it. Okay. Because they would have a list of, they would have their tank set up, and then they had a little card with a list of species on it, plus the the area they were trying to replicate, which was a really good idea. Did they have a photo, like a live? A live? Some did. Okay. Yeah, some did have, have a photo of uh, what it looked like underwater or, or you know mm-hmm. from the top or whatever so it was a really neat experience i'd like to do one again can you describe uh, the tank that won <coughs> um water <laughs> it was water Some the, the one that i liked the best it had a, a lot of plant growth in okay. it so it was a lot of native plants and there was very there were very few fish but there were uh, some shrimp and crayfish in it the native shrimp and crayfish and uh, i I would have to show you a picture of sure, it to sure. have a good look at it. But I really appreciated the work that everyone put into their, their tanks, even the, the ones that didn't place. They were all extremely beautiful, and these mm-hmm. people had obviously put a lot of thought into their display. Yeah. So Yeah, when, yeah. You, when you flip through the, uh, the fish magazines and you see highlights from an aquascaping competition, mm. where, whether it's domestic or international, and even the tanks that don't win, right. it's like, my goodness. The like, ACA crazy. this year is in Cromwell, Connecticut. And it's uh, it's in July, and they're I don't believe they're having a regular traditional fish show like we usually do. It's going to be a biotope contest for cichlids. Nice. Yeah, that's really uh, really cool. So it's something different. Um, so to your point, then, do you think we'll see more South American, Central American setups as opposed to Rift Lakes? I would think so. Yeah. I don't know for sure, but I think that would be the logical. So just having like rock outcroppings with some with some algae growth and some sand. Well, for the most part, like West Africa, maybe, um, True. and parts of Central and South America would probably make for the best display, right. I would think, right. rather than a, a riff lake. Yeah, yeah mm-hmm. it's, it's so unfortunate that we always think of, at least in my head, you automatically go to riff lakes. Right. When you think of African cichlids, yeah. and it's like these poor, what, pelvicromis and... Yeah, all these some of these beautiful you know, fish in beautiful, West Africa yeah, and yeah. the crater lakes and all kinds of, you know, the, the uh, <coughs> Lake Natron, you know... Uh, uh, we'll leave it a surprise, but I'll have to pick your brain on a good guest for uh, talking about West African cichlids. Okay. Uh, who to have on. And, okay. Uh, there's, there's some yeah, great cause, ones. Because that, that's a whole area where it's so... Cichlids in general are very misrepresented on my show. Yeah. Um, you know, I need to get more African cichlid talk. I need to get more West African, um, get a little bit more Central American talk going on. Oh, I but, can uh, help you out with some some good people that I know that can help you out there. Jose Gonzalez, he was a, uh, he was a great he, guy. Fascinating so, guy, yeah, huh? Talking about good deeds, and oh, that was, that guy was wonderful. Is awesome. And, I could listen to him for hours. Yeah, Madagascar cichlids yeah. in, uh, in good deeds, so that was good You times. see the work he does with these fish. Yeah. He's... Well, he posts, um, he, so he does post his videos online, and I've tried to, maybe I'll, I'll you know, plug his, 
YouTube again uh, <coughs> in this me. show notes. But yeah, he you know he puts these unedited, fairly I, I would assume they're unedited, unnarrated mm-hmm. shots of his tanks, and um, they're you know he does he does a really good job of showing. He has off large these. vats in the backyard mm-hmm. and ponds and everything yeah. set up. Oh yeah. yeah, he's an amazing person. There's a lot of there's a lot of really incredible people in the fish hobby. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yep. No, good times. For sure. So what else do you have planned then for, uh, let's say, what, how do you round out 2019 then? Um, I plan to do a lot more oh, birding. You, you heard a bird. Yeah. <laughs> sorry, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> We've only seen robins today, unfortunately. We've seen robins. We've uh, heard lots. Maybe like a finch-esque kind of bird. Uh, woodpeckers. I saw a butterfly. A couple, oh, yeah, cool. really neat butterfly. For the, for the rest of the year, I've got a couple more uh, speaking engagements and travel that I'm going to do. Uh, I plan on doing a lot more birding, mm-hmm. and I'd like to make a. I'd like to do a uh, trip back home, a leisurely trip back to mm-hmm. uh, Canada. So mm-hmm. I'll probably do that yeah. late summer, early fall. What What is your? I don't, um, not to jump back onto this topic, but it just popped in my head. What is your primary outlet? So let's say you you downsize the fish room, mm-hmm. but as far as the species that you keep, you're going to be laser focused. And let's say that you know you are you are breeding healthy juvenile fish Mm -hmm. right what is your outlet for these guys like it can't just be your the hill country society it can't just be um austin aquarium society is there is there opportunity for you know people that listen to this podcast that are interested in say that snail eating cichlid that you know was first captured or brought in the 80s like hey greg here's my resume like whatever form they need to fill out here's the tank they're going to go in it's a it's going to be a species only 40 breeder uh, for somebody to reach out directly to you um, to get some of these fish so that you can continue to, you know, promote and spread these fish to uh, throughout the hobby. When I have the fish, and that's mm-hmm. part of the, the oh, it problem I've had. Well, I've, I believe you will. <laughs> I have faith in you. I have. The, the thing that, that's really detrimental to the, my thinking here is that I have all kinds of fish breeding. Mm-hmm. And I'm not saving the fry anymore. And that's a, that's a, that's a big deal to mm-hmm. me because there's a lot of people that want to work with these fish. Mm-hmm. So I, I'm just kind of a little overwhelmed with things right mm-hmm. now, and it took me a while to come to grips with that. Where do you, so, where, where do you think the outlet will be? Like maybe ACA forums? And, yeah. No, there's, there's never a problem getting rid of fish. There's always people that... Um, I have a, I have a uh, website and a Facebook page that I... AfricanCichlids.net mm-hmm. that I post videos of my fish of quite often. And invariably, every time I post a video, I get so many inquiries like is this fish available can you ship blah Mm -hmm. blah 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 and i i don't Mm -hmm. um but there's the outlet for it's there getting rid of the fish is not a problem okay yeah that that would be the least of my concerns so so if somebody listening to this from minnesota was like you know what greg i'm patient that fish you're talking about is awesome put me on that list is there is is there room for something like that in the future yeah in the future there would be okay but that's part part of my problem now and why i want to downsize is because i have a lot of those requests and i can't fill them because uh i don't have the time to do it yeah i just don't have the time plain and simply and it's uh I, I have I could make the time to do it, but then I would have to take away from some of the things that I've become involved with that I like a lot. So there's got to be a happy medium. Yeah. And it took me a while to come to grips with that, but yeah. that's where I am now. Yeah, there, there's that fine line where you don't want the hobby to feel like work. And when I was right? younger, it didn't. Mm-hmm. You know, I didn't mind doing water changes uh, all weekend long and, and maintaining, uh, I guess I had upwards of 200 aquariums at one time. It was a lot of work, but I didn't feel like it was work mm-hmm. because it it was it was a hobby it was fun i enjoyed doing it uh, you know mm-hmm. um but those days are gone yeah. <laughs> it's work now yeah. now that i'm older it's work well the, the care is interest increasing has got to be a nice mm-hmm. boon like for me this podcast every time i get a comment from a new person that says hey i just found you i just binge listened to 40 or 50 oh, wow. episodes over a weekend like i am uh, you know keep it up you're doing a great job that for me on a down week or a down month of doing the podcast week over week yeah. is just, man, that's invigorating. So right. I would imagine that seeing so much interest in cares and mm-hmm. like a club in China being interested in cares, like that's got to be a nice shot in the arm to everybody. That's you know? a really, that's a, that is a really nice shot in the arm, as you say. And it's, uh, I would like to spend more time promoting and, and taking care of mm-hmm. my, uh, my obligations to cares mm-hmm. as well. Yeah. Yeah. So. Because on one hand, there kind of is your time could be better spent to promote the fish mm-hmm. through not actually breeding them, but promoting, you know, taking the research, taking the talks that you've done, um, and using your platform 
to inform. Yeah, for sure. As opposed to just being in your fish room and distributing the actual physical fish, right? I, I don't want to make it. I don't want to make it sound like I'm giving up fish. Mm-hmm. That that is not what I'm doing at all. What I'm doing is, like you said, that laser uh, narrowing down my interest, mm-hmm. so I can better take care of the ones that need it the most mm-hmm. and that I like the most. Yeah. So it's not. I, th- I think if I continue on this path and just try to keep things going with the amount of tanks that I have running and, and the amount of fish that I'm taking care of, the potential to, bre- to burn out is there. Mm-hmm. I've seen it happen to other people. Yeah. And I've been a lifelong hobbyist, so I don't want that to happen. So mm-hmm. I can realize I know myself. I know what's happened to other people. I just know I have to do this mm-hmm. to, in order for me to maintain my interest in the hobby. Yeah, if that it, makes any sense. Yeah, no, because it's easy to turn your dedicated fish room into a man cave with yeah. a big screen TV and <laughs> True a lazy enough. boy sofa, a sofa and things like that. You know, you've already partitioned off this separate space of your house and your yard. So <laughs> that's um, true. You know, it's all, it's always like an escape plan, if you will. But yeah. you know, you don't. You want it to be fun. You want it to be enjoyable at the same time. So yeah, and who knows what'll happen in the future? Maybe, maybe. Uh, my my uh, interest will shift and I will get back and uh, start adding more fish again you know mm-hmm. uh, but I, at this point in my life I can't do I, that. I don't think there's anything wrong with the path that you've laid out like the strategy sure. that you have I think I have I'm in full support of it I think <laughs> um, I think if you were to downsize to you know four tanks and continue to do more of the the promotion aspect of it and, and give your talks and share all of your experience that you've mm-hmm. already done with people i think there's so much benefit to that well thanks um so no i i, I think you know, i do love i do love cichlids i, I do love uh haplochromine cichlids it'll always be a part of my life so i never want to lose that completely that fly that landed on me was almost as big as a bird so yeah i should have taken a picture of that and there's i would have got one man, there's been a couple big <laughs> that was a life for you yeah <laughs> <laughs> All right, Greg. Well, we need to get down this mountain. Gravity cool. is on our side. Yeah, true enough. So this should be good times, and I need to get you to uh, your talk. So we've got some time. Awesome. But, uh, Greg, this has been a unique, <laughs> yeah, one sure of a has, kind, right? two fish nerds on top of a mountain next to a waterfall. I love it. I love it. Talking about fish. So uh, let me see. Uh, 52 episodes from now. 52 Can episodes. Can I come back? 52 episodes from now. All right. Come back. This, <laughs> I'll cause this, to it. Because this will be, unless something crazy happens, this will be episode 60, I think. Nice. I'm pretty sure episode 60, yeah. so more than a year cool. of doing this. See you later. He's too friendly. He says hi to everybody. <laughs> 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 All right, Greg. It's been wonderful, man. Let's, Thanks, uh, Randy. Let's get down this mountain. Okay, man.